In the previous lecture, we looked at topic 1.1, rates of reactions. In this lecture, we're moving on to 1.2, and we're going to look at atomic structure. Inside the atom, we have a nucleus right in the very centre of the atom. And the nucleus contains two subatomic particles, protons and neutrons. And then orbiting round the nucleus, we have our electron. So these are the three subatomic particles uh, we find inside an atom, protons, neutrons and electrons. So you should know where they're found, protons and neutrons in the nucleus, electrons orbiting outside the nucleus. But you should also know the mass and charge of each one. When it comes to mass, the entire mass of the atom is contained in the nucleus. Proton and neutron both weigh much the same. We say they weigh one unit, one mass unit. Okay? So it's one mass unit for the proton, one for the neutron. And the electron, although it does have some mass, it's so close to zero that we can approximate it to zero. So the entire mass of the atom is found in this tiny little nucleus in the centre. Most of the atom is actually just empty space. Charge is very important. Protons are positively charged. They have a charge of 1 plus. Neutrons are neutral, they've got no charge. And the electrons are negatively charged, they're 1 minus. So, the nucleus has always got a positive charge, depending how many protons are in there. One proton is one plus, two protons, two plus. The electron being negatively charged, well, you know, this electron at the moment is wanting to go off in this direction and leave the atom. That's where its momentum's taken it. But at the same time, because it's negatively charged, it's got a electrostatic attraction to the nucleus because opposites attract and positive and negatives attract just like opposite ends of a magnet. So it's been pulled in towards the centre of the nucleus at the same time it's been pulled away from the nucleus and what happens these two forces balance and the electron ends up just in an orbit going round and round and round the nucleus. Now, there's lots of different types of atoms, and different atoms will vary depending on how many protons, how many neutrons, and how many electrons are in the atom. And we use nuclide notation to allow you to work out how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are in an atom. So here's a sodium atom. The number in the bottom left is known as the atomic number. The number in the top left is known as the mass number. So the atomic number tells you what type of atom you've got, the mass number tells you how heavy it is. So from this you should be able to work out that sodium atom contains 11 protons because it's the number of protons which determines what element it is. If you've got one proton in the nucleus, the atomic number is one, your hydrogen. Two protons, atomic number is two, your helium. Atomic number 11, you've got 11 protons, you're a sodium atom. It's got 12 neutrons. You know that because the mass number is 23. So these two numbers have to add up to 23, because the mass number is protons plus neutrons. The easiest way to look at it is the difference between these two numbers gives you the number of neutrons. And finally, the number of electrons. Well, we think to remember that an atom is neutral. That's why there's no positive or negative signs up here. It's neutral. Because it's neutral, it means an atom has the same number of protons as electrons. So this has got 11 positive charges, so it must have 11 negative charges. 
So the number of electrons are 11. Okay, the exact same as the number of protons. So, the atomic number, 11. So the, oh dear. So the atomic number of 11 okay, tells you how many protons you've got. The difference between those two numbers tells you how many neutrons you've got and if it's an atom the electrons will be the same as the protons. Right, the protons and the neutrons are just stuffed into that little nucleus in the centre of the atom. The arrangement of the electrons is a bit more complicated. Okay so here's a sodium atom so here's its nucleus it's got its 11 protons and 12 neutrons stuffed in there. Now we've got 11 electrons Initially the electrons go as close to the nucleus as possible. This is known as the first energy level. Second electron goes in there too. At this stage this electron shell is full. It won't take any more electrons. You can only squash two electrons into this orbit. So the third electron has got into this second energy level which is further away from the nucleus. It's bigger and will take up to 8 electrons. So our 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th electron goes into the second energy level. This second energy level is now full. So our 11th and final electron has got into the third energy level. So we say the electron arrangement for sodium is 281. So 2 is the number of electrons in the first shell. 8 is the number of electrons in the second shell and 1 is the number of electrons in the third shell. Now on page 6 of your data booklet and you might see this more clearly if you look at your data booklet you've got a table which gives you the electron arrangement of many of the atoms and very interesting patterns arise. If you look at the elements in group 1 they all have one electron in the outer shell whether it's hydrogen 1, sodium 281, or cesium 2818881, they all have one electron in the outer shell. And this is why they all have similar chemical properties. Because atoms want to have a full outer shell. So all these elements want to lose one electron in order to get a full outer shell. So that's why they have similar chemical properties. Same group 2, they all have 2 electrons in the outer shell. Group 3, 3 and so on. Up to group 7, we've got fluorine 27, <coughs> chlorine 287. And here they're all wanting to gain one electron to get a full outer shell. And then group 0, the noble gases, they all have a full outer shell, which in most cases is 8 electrons. The only exception is helium which only has that first shell full which is going to take two electrons. So these all have full ele outer electron levels so they don't take part in chemical reactions because they they're happy. So let's take go back to sodium again. It's 281. It wants to lose one electron to get a full outer shell. If it does lose one electron, it will have an electron arrangement of 2,8, which is the same as neon. Okay. Now, no, no two atoms in the periodic table have the same electron arrangement. In order for two to have the same electron arrangement, one will have to lose or gain electrons. And when they lose or gain electrons, they're no longer neutral, so they're not atoms, they're ions. So let's have a look at ions. So here's our sodium. It's a sodium ion. It's got a charge of 1 plus. Now it still have 11 protons because it's got atomic number 11. So it's a sodium atom. Still got 12 neutrons in the nucleus. Nucleus doesn't change during chemical reactions. The difference between those two numbers, 12. 
but the number of electrons have changed. Okay. It's got a positive charge, so it's got more protons than electrons. You can't change the number of protons. It's sodium, so it must be 11. So it's lost one electron, so it must only have 10 electrons. So it's got 10 negative charges, 11 positive charges. So that gives it a charge of 1 plus. We don't put in the 1 when it's 1 plus. If it was 2 plus, we put in 2 plus. And of course, it's like an arrangement, only having two electrons is two heat. A full outer electron shell. Let's look at another ion. Sulfur 2 minus ion. Well, the number of protons, 16. That's what makes it sulfur. Number of neutrons, difference between these two numbers, 17. Then the number of electrons, if it was an atom, it would have 16. But it's 2 minus, which means it's gained 2 electrons. So the number of electrons must be 18. And again, the electron arrangement of the iron will have a full outer shell. It's 288. Finally, we looked at isotopes and relative atomic mass. Now, isotopes are two slightly different atoms of the same element. So, same atomic number, different mass number. Or in other words, must have same number of protons, different number of neutrons. So basically, the two in this case, it's two atoms of copper, which weigh slightly different amounts. This one weigh, only weighs 63, this one weighs 65. Now, most elements have several isotopes. Isotopes are not strange things. You get usually two, three, four, five different isotopes of most elements in the periodic table. For copper, we've got these two main isotopes. If we look up the relative atomic mass in your data booklet, I remember if relative atomic mass, you can always think of as average atomic mass. It tells you the average atomic mass is 63.5. That tells us which isotope is the most abundant. If we had the exact same numbers of the ones that weigh 63 and the ones that weigh 65, then the relative of average atomic mass would lie exactly halfway in between. It would be 64. The fact that the average is 63.5, it's close to the copper 63, so that means that's the most abundant isotope. So you get more of the copper 63 in your sample than you do 65. Okay, four things this time you should be must be able to do. Okay, so go back and watch the lecture again if you can't do any of these things. So you should be able to recall the structure of an atom, including the mass and charge of the protons, neutrons, and electrons. You should be able to use nuclide notation to determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons uh, in any atom or ion. You should be able to determine the electron arrangement of any atom or ion using the information on page 6 of your data booklet. And you should be able to recognise isotopes and determine the most abundant if given the relative stroke average atomic mass. So make sure those four things are things you must be able to do from this topic.